Today, we're going to talk about being strong in the Lord. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Father, we thank you today for your word. Thank you for being our preacher and our teacher. Give us insight and wisdom as we study. We'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We are involved in, as I said earlier, what I believe could be the most important study that we have ever done as a church as a whole. There there have been a lot of things that God has led me to do in my 50 plus years of preaching, but I don't think anything has impacted my life any more than putting this material together and getting it ready to be printed. And so we we talked about the enemy. We are in a spiritual battle. Whether you want to be or not, when you invited Jesus to come into your life, forgive you of your sins and make you a Christian, you enlisted. And so then you have an enemy that's trying to take you down and he will try to use your family your friends, whatever he can to attack. If our church, if the church, the universal mystical body of Christ is to be the life-changing victorious church that God intended for us to be, we must realize the conquering power that God has given us over Satan and his demonic forces. In our study of deliverance so far, we have seen the origin and the operation of Satan and the demonic cohorts that work under his leadership. We have seen that there is a war going on around us between ministering spirits of God and the spirits of darkness, and they're fighting over my life and over your life. Demon spirits are frenzied. And they're running loose in these last days. They are out to destroy the children of God, our families, our homes, and our nation. You say, preacher, why would you say that? Because they too are aware that we are living in these last days before the return of Christ for his church. And I hope you don't misunderstand what I'm getting ready to say because I, we've talked about this a little bit downstairs. A few Mondays ago, I sat in front of my TV and tears came down my face as I saw the capital of Israel opened and moved and restored to Jerusalem. And I told my son and Linda, what you are seeing today is history in making and prophecy being fulfilled. Now, Satan understands the word of God. He's not stupid. And so he knows that there are things going on in the world around us today that are pointing directly at the end of time as we know it. I believe that that God is getting his church and the world ready for his son to return. And Satan doesn't like that. He doesn't like us to talk about it. He don't like for preachers to preach about it. And he doesn't like for us to expose him for who he is. The Bible commands us to be strong in the Lord. But to be strong in the Lord, it takes more than the Lord just doing his part. It takes us, you and I, to make a commitment to obey the command to be strong in the Lord. Now, first of all, if you're going to be strong in the Lord and maintain our strength in him as he has commanded us, we need to learn, first of all, to be steadfast. Now, what does the word steadfast mean? 
Well, according to the, the dictionary, it says, steadfast means loyal, unwavering, not changing, firm of purpose, firmly still, unchangeable, and established. These are pretty descriptive words when Paul said, be strong in the Lord, be steadfast in the Lord. Let's take this word for an example, loyal. There are a lot of people who are loyal as long as everything is going well in their life. But to steadfast means you're loyal when things really aren't happening the way that you thought they were going to happen in your life, in your life, and in your church, and in your family. Are you listening to me? You see, through my years as pastor, I have learned that there are, there are lots of people who want to praise God and shout and dance and have a hallelujah time as long as everything's going good. But to, to be steadfast means to be loyal even when things aren't happening the way that you thought they ought to be. And those folks, when everything's going good and they're having their way, are y'all listening? They say, oh yeah, we're loyal, praise God, thank you Jesus, hallelujah. But when the least bit of adversity comes, well, the FBI can't find them. <laughs> I, I mean, listen, if they had been a part of the Apostle Paul's traveling company, I'm afraid they wouldn't have made it out the gate. We are living in a time today like no other time that you and I have ever lived in. America is rolling in luxury. We are reveling in pleasure and we are rotting in sin. Passions run amok like riderless horses. Lust is exalted as Lord. Sin is treated as sovereignty and Satan is worshiped as a saint. From perverted politicians who promote godless legislation to the street punk with an assault rival to the so-called solid citizens who shake their fist in the face of holy God, I promise you Satan is possessed, this nation. You say, wait a minute, preacher. You said Christians can't be possessed. I didn't say he possessed Christians. I said he's got this nation possessed. This onslaught of evil is much too sinister and much too subtle to be the work of some human origin. It is the carefully calculated conspiracy of demonic entities in the world in which we live today. We have also seen in our study how Satan uses open doors to get into our personal lives and then into our families. We've seen the importance of intercessory prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit. In this study, we're going to look at Paul's admonition to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The Word of God is telling us to do something. That's a command. In the military, when a command is given, you just simply obey it. Whether you think it's right or wrong or somewhere in between. There is no negotiating with an individual in authority who gave you the command, you just simply obey it. The Apostle Paul, however, was steadfast in his loyalty. In the face of every obstacle that he incurred, he was still loyal to the message of faith in God's word. Paul incurred tremendous adversity. He was left for dead, physically beaten several times, put in jail many times, and yet he was still loyal. Not one time did he ever waver pursuing the high calling of God in Christ Jesus for his life. 
You can talk about love all you want. You can talk about loyalty all you want. But listen, talking and doing are two different things. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus tied some things together that's sometimes a little nerve-wracking. And this is what he said in verses 37 through 40, and you have this memorized. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, says Christ, hang all the law and the prophets. All the, all the prophecy that you've heard, all the law that you've heard, he is telling those disciples. Let me put it to you in one neat little package. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbors yourself. You know what I found in my life? You know what I found in the life of most church people? We really don't have a big, huge problem loving the Lord with everything we have within us. But Jesus also said to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know you've heard me talk about this a lot. And as long as I'm your pastor, you're going to hear me talk about it again. And I'm going to be your pastor a long, long time. I just thought you'd know. I got, I got me a new insurance policy the other day that, that Art wrote me out an insurance policy and said, I'm going to live to be 100 and I can still preach then. That's what that insurance policy said. Art didn't know it was in the small print, but I put it in there when there wasn't anybody looking. <laughs> and I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, on the authority of the word of God until you and I learn to fulfill the commandment of God to love our neighbor as we love ourselves we cannot expect to have the move of God and the power of God demonstrated in our lives, in our church, or in our nation. Now, I want you to listen to me very, very carefully because I'm going to say something that's going to be offensive to some of you. How can we ever have peace and unity in our nation, as long as there is resentment and anger and bigotry in the church of a living God. Did you hear what I said? We're looking for the world to have an attitude of Christ, and we can't even have it inside the body of Christ ourselves. Say so you're right, preacher. Son, that hurt some of you, didn't it? Once more. Thank you, Granny. I love you, honey. Please allow me to remind you that people are not your enemy. People are not your enemy. What we need to realize is we need to deal with the real enemy which you and I know this Bible talks about as Satan. For instance, if somebody's giving you a hard time at work, don't deal with that individual because that individual is not your enemy. Now, they may be a horse's patoot, but that's not your enemy. And still, you need to deal with the unseen enemy who's causing the problem. Because chances are very, very well that Satan is trying to use an individual that doesn't even know he or she's being used to try to trip you up in your walk with God. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 reminds us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The word of God is simply telling us here, don't deal with flesh and blood. In other words, don't worry about other people. We need to realize that we need to stand in faith against an enemy that's trying to take us down. So instead of getting out of love and talking about this person and that person, we can use our energy on an unseen enemy who is Satan. 
He's the one who's working behind the scenes. He's the one who's causing the ill feelings and the problems in our lives. He's the one who's trying to divide your marriage and your family. He's the one who's trying to destroy your finances and and steal away your peace of mind and joy unspeakable and full of glory. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, until you and I understand who we are in Christ, he'll continue to keep your spiritual butt. You say, Preacher, can you say that in a little bit? No, just pretend you didn't hear that. Have you ever heard a judge tell a jury, pretend you didn't hear that? Oh, yeah, I hit your delete button. That ain't going to happen. Paul said to the church in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith in giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Now I want you to listen to me and listen to me well. Because Satan has blinded the minds of some preachers and some laymen alike, he has been able to bring some very twisted teachings inside the church. We don't call sin sin any longer. We call it a problem. And so we tell them to go see the psychologist. A a murderer is no longer a heinous criminal. He's just simply a victim of society born on the wrong side of the tracks. He was deprived the right because of our socioeconomic opportunities. And he's the real victim, not the people he killed. That's what's being taught today, ladies and gentlemen. Adultery is no longer considered a sin in Hollywood or in over 90% of the church world. Movies and television never show the disastrous consequences of having sexual relationships with everybody who comes by, male, female, and something in between. The audience never gets a hint that AIDS exists. Teenager, teenage sexuality will result in nearly one million pregnancies in 2018, which will lead to 406,000 abortions, 134,000 miscarriages, and 490,000 live births. About three million teens will contact sexually transmitted diseases in this year that you and I are living in. Half the marriages in this nation will end in divorce. Even in the church, the divorce rate is keeping pace with the rest of America. Alcoholism is no longer considered a sin. Instead, the alcoholic has a disease. And we spend millions upon millions of dollars advertising each year to propagate this sin in our society. You say, preacher, what are you saying? Well, let me give you a little example. We put a state-funded liquor store on one corner and a rehab center on the other. The state advertises their product and the rehab center gets the results. The President of the United States promised, he promised that he would give us a cabinet that looks a lot like America. 25% of Americans claim to be evangelical Christians. But how many have been put in high places, high level positions in our government? Very few, if any. Doctrines of humanism and modernistic theology erode the very fabric of the Word of God. Churches have sold out to accommodate the world's decaying values in order that we may be politically correct. We no longer believe in the blood of Christ in many of our churches and in many of our seminaries today. They no longer believe in the cross. They no longer believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, I am not talking to you about philosophies today. I am not talking to you about ideas or tendencies or sociological trends. I'm talking about what the Bible calls demon spirits dispatched 
into the realm of the supernatural to inflict the lives God so lovingly designed and created. Everything I mentioned so far today ties together with being strong in the Lord. I tell you today, it is important that we get out all of these things in order in our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a devil on the loose. Teen suicide is the third cause of death among adolescents in our world today. Between 1960 and 1990, the rate of teen suicide increased 400%. Now you listen, I want you to get this. When our children living in our homes and attending our churches are tormented in their minds and driven to take their lives, there is a devil on the loose. When public school systems ban the Bible and use our tax dollars to pass our condoms, there is a devil on the loose. When 28% of all babies in America are born to single mothers, there is a devil on the loose. Listen to me. We don't need another social program. We don't need another governmental policy. We don't need another self-help psychology book. We just simply need to recognize as the body of Christ, there is a devil on the loose. We need to have a strong commitment to obey the word of God. We need to be steadfast in our faith and hold steady to endure the hardships of the battle that we're involved in. We also need to know how to operate in faith and based on a godly love toward those who are unlovable. We need to learn how to deal with an unseen enemy with the word in prayer using the name of Jesus as our authority. Listen to this challenge found in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23. Continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you've heard. Child of God, we are living in perilous times. We are living when the church is afraid and the enemy is having one victory after another victory after another victory in our homes, in our lives, in our nation, and in our churches. Child of God, you are what the Word of God says you are. You can do what the Word of God says you can do. You can have what the Word of God says you can have. My challenge to you today is simply this. Believe it, speak it, and live it. If you're in this place today and you know you invited Jesus Christ to come into your life and forgive you of your sins and make you a Christian, I encourage you today to say yes. Do not leave this place lost without Jesus Christ. Let's stand together. Heads bowed, eyes closed, hands up. If you'll make this your personal prayer, I want you to say it out loud with me. Father, your word is true. Give me the courage to look past my circumstances and understand who my real enemy really is. I can because I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who loves me. In Jesus' name. Amen.